all welcome back to Ladywood Power Wasa, Armina Sadi. How are you guys doing today? You guys good? Yeah. All right. Is there anybody here who is afraid of being asked a question? Okay, let me ask, who are the people not afraid to be asked a question? I just want to ask you something. Okay, right there. I love you. Were quick. What? All right, here's my question for you. Why are you in this group? Join. Uh, I joined maybe like three, four years ago. For what? Uh, to talk to men about business, about their faith, to get some direction in my life. Okay. And through John, uh, who was a part of this program back then, and meeting people that here. Yep. Uh, talking to people. Uh, I've learned some lessons, uh, gained some knowledge. That's good. Now, now I'm supporting the ministry. I love it. Keep supporting, man. This is an amazing place. Who else is not afraid to answer that question? Go ahead, sir. I'm here as a guest of Pastor Dan Cohn. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love it. All right. Uh, anybody tell me a personal reason why you guys are in this group? Quiet group. All right. Go ahead, sir. Makes me a better person. Say more. I'm a better person. Okay. This. I love that. All right. So the reason I asked that question is because I just want to point out the significance of this group. This this taking place is more important than you guys realize. It was already important before the pandemic, but it is fundamentally more important now post pandemic. Okay. Um, let me just ask this. How many of you guys are dealing with serious problems in your life? I don't mean your, your parents not sleeping like who that me too, Sam too. Like we all have that. Right. But how many of you are dealing with some life altering, deep rooted problems right now? Okay, just very few. Okay, so this is for you guys. The rest of you guys, just listen. Is that cool? Okay, I'm not. I, I just so you guys know, I'm not an entertainer. I'm not trying to like infotainment type guy. I I, I just I, I I am someone who deals and s serves with the military and veterans on a very daily basis. I deal with suicide and death on a hourly basis. I just like to go to the core of root causes of problems and I just want to annihilate them. It's, it's, it's the culture I'm in, it's a culture I adopted and that's why I just want to do. Are you guys okay with that? And if I offend you, feel free to slap me. I've been slapped before. Is that cool? All right. So for those of you who didn't raise your hands, let me just list off a bunch of things and maybe you get triggered, maybe you don't. Okay. COVID-19. Racial injustice, political polarization, January 6th, Roe versus Wade, Supreme Court, the Great Resignation, declining church attendance, pastors quitting at record levels, U.S. life expectancy declining for the first time in over a century, worship wars, culture wars, actual war in Ukraine, old Christians staying home from church, young Christians de deconstructing their faith, the rise of Christian nationalism, the decline of Christian affiliation, housing is unaffordable, the national debt is unimaginable, employees are unhirable, ideological divisions seem to be unbridgeable, aging is unstoppable, death is inevitable, global warming is apparently universal, winter has come to Wisconsin, and the Minnesota Vikings are better than the Green Bay Packers this year. <laughs> I'm willing to get stabbed, like I said, I'm, I'm okay with this. So at the end of the day, I'm just trying to tee up that we all have problems. How deep these problems go, or how public we want to be, or how transparent or vulnerable we want to be, is entirely up to us. Society around us will never make it easy for us to truly be transparent. Never. It is a shame-based culture that we live in, okay? But that's not even what I'm trying to deal with. That's what I dealt with last time. So. What I'm trying to do is that just pointing out their struggles and I'm going to keep beating a dead horse here. Everybody is struggling with emotional health issues or depression or anxiety or financial problems, vocational issues, financial issues, uh, 
death of a dream they had, uh, burnout, family estrangement, or addiction, or abuse, the loss of a home, the loss of health, or loneliness, or regret, and the list goes on and on. Would you agree with those are being a lot of common problems in our society right now? Yeah. Awesome. I love it. You guys are giving feedback now. All right, so we all know we need help and support. Every single person in here. If you convince yourself you don't, you probably have some of the deepest rooted problems. If you think you're good on your own. One of the greatest things I learned from these Vietnam vets that have all become some of my greatest mentors and father's figures, they, they literally, they would they grab me by, by the shirt. It, the one time I said, I got this. All, those are the three words I said. It was, I got this, right? And I, I was going through whatever I was going through and I said, I got this. And Ray, that was his name, he grabbed me by my shirt and he looked and he's looking down at me and he said, don't ever say I got this. He's like, if you ever want to know how I know you're going to die soon is when you say I got this. That is the greatest lie you could ever believe. You don't got this. Roger that, sir. I'll get to that. Let's keep going. So even more challenging of just trying to even identify or forget identify, but articulate where our greatest needs uh, for help and support are. Even if we can I articulate it, here's what gets even more challenging is when you're this burnt out coming through this much crap that we have all gone through as a society, the, the, finding the motivation to even doing it or figuring out where to start and where to end is dang near impossible. It's just, it just feels like a lost cause half the time. Like, what am I doing? Where do I go? Who do I talk to? What even works? What doesn't work, right? So here, here's, again, everything I'm going to talk about is lessons I've learned from Vietnam vets, okay? Trying to solve our own problems by ourselves is an impossible mission. Anytime, like Ray says, you say, if you catch yourself saying, I got this, from Ray's perspective, is you're basically believing what the enemy is trying to tell you and he wants you to be on your own. He wants you to believe that you got this so that in your isolation, he can take you, own you, manipulate you, kill you and destroy you in every way, shape and form. I don't disagree with Ray. That guy's seen more blood, more death, more gore. I, I, I don't even want to repeat the stories I've heard about him from Vietnam War, but uh, the, this is a man who knows what he's talking about. So what I'm trying to deal with is, and I'm not trying to talk to you guys from a place of superiority. Please understand that. I'm a messed up human being, okay? I'm, I'm trying to talk to you guys from a place of empathy because this is exactly where I was and this is what it took for me to be alive today. There, there isn't a shred of arrogance in me about this topic. I'm not, I'm not a thought leader, I'm not a subject matter expert. This is just my experience and these are the people who saved my life and I'm just hoping to God, even if there's one of you guys dealing with isolation and loneliness, that is the problem I'm trying to ch deal with today. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. Um, and uh, here's the thing is a lot of times you ask yourself, it, are, are the problems I'm dealing with solvable? Because more often than not, they repeat themselves over and over again. So you kind of assume, okay, it's just gonna keep happening. So what's the point of trying to deal with it? Whatever that problem might be. If you're in church circles, you probably hear about masturbation, porn addictions, blah, 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 all the time, right? Or adultery or um, whatever it might be. I, I don't know what circles you're all in. I don't wanna assume that you guys are all in a church. Um, but here's the challenge with the way in our society we deal with problems. Um, let me give an example. Is, um, we usually deal with the top, top of the problem, you know, like a surface level issue. So like, for example, say I have a blood clotting disorder. I cut my arm. You're a good man. You see I'm bleeding. You want to help me. You grab a paper towel. You come r r rinse off my blood and you give me a good solid sesame band-aid and we're good, right? But then you see me speaking and you see I'm bleeding through. And you're like, well, sesame is not working. so. You're like, well, I got a Barney Band-Aid and it's bigger. Let's put that on there, but I'm still bleeding through. You're obviously a good man and you're wearing red. You're like, I got this. I can cover the blood stain. So you grab some gauze and you tape and then you, I'm still bleeding through, right? So your Sesame Street, your Barney, your gauze and tape isn't solving my problem because all, all we're seeing is me bleeding and we're thinking if I cover it up, it's going to solve the problem. No, it's not. I need something to clot my blood. But that's what we do with 
vast majority of our problems, we deal with the surface. We never go to the root cause of the problem. We do it on a corporate level. I do it as, as a president of a big nonprofit. I do root cause analysis all the time to solve problems. But somehow I'm incompetent in doing it in my own personal life. So it's not that I don't know how to do it, but why don't I do it when it comes to my personal life? I'll do it to make an organization successful, but I won't do it for my own personal health and mental health. It's, it's actually mind boggling for me when I process my own life of how stupid I am sometimes. No one else in this room feels that way, I'm sure, but for me, holy cow. Um, so, it, we, and, and, and let's just be honest, we take this approach with marital problems, parental problems, mental health problems, spiritual problems. We take a very surface level approach to how we deal with our problems. So here's what I want to get to though. Um, my goal here is to point out one massive problem that we're dealing with uh, across the nation right now. And that problem is isolation and loneliness. Okay, I don't want to share my opinion because no one in this room or anywhere else gives a crap about my opinion. So all I want to give you guys is actual statistics, okay? So you don't have to listen to me. My opinion is irrelevant. But let me start with that problem statement. And this is statistically speaking. Even before the pandemic, the United States of America is considered the most socially isolated society on planet Earth. Again, not an opinion. This is a statistical fact. The metrics that they used for this were things like the amount of time you spent alone in your car, the amount of uh, time you spent eating by yourself, the amount of time that you spent in front of a TV, the amount of time the average person spent in front of a screen, like a phone, a laptop, uh, a tablet, whatever else it might be. The number of times per week we sat around a dinner table together as a family or with friends. So it, it is a laundry list. And for once, we took a gold medal we didn't want. And we still don't want that gold medal. Older generation, you guys were probably raised up in a different way, where their community was a lot deeper. There was a lot of time hanging out. My generation, not so much. We are socially challenged. I'll put it that way. How many of you guys, uh, and you're, I hope you don't have employees in here, but how many of you guys have millennials on your team if you have staff? Would you agree with slightly socially challenged? Slightly. All good. I don't want to get you in trouble. So if you're asking the question, how can isolation be that big of a problem? Let me just give you guys some. Uh, this is a summary from uh, Harvard University, okay? Harvard University says loneliness and isolation is a culprit in a whole slew of problems including depression, anxiety, substance abuse, heart disease, and domestic uh, abuse. Problems that all appear to be ticking up during the pandemic. Um, anxiety symptoms were three times higher uh, during the pandemic and, uh, for, for uh, depression and four times higher for uh, anxiety. Moreover, loneliness and depression can brutally compound one another with depression breeding loneliness and loneliness breeding depression. Research suggests that loneliness can curdle into suspicion, contempt, and aggression as well. Loneliness is related to worse physical and cognitive functioning and early mortality. Research also shows finds that lacking social connection carries the same if not greater health risks as heavy smoking, drinking, and obesity. Not or obesity and obesity, the three combined, okay? And this suffering and these problems are likely to only spread and deepen over the winter as people become more isolated and the absence of loved ones feels more acute, okay? That, 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 that's more sentence form. So let me go to the foremost thought leader on this topic of isolation. Her name is Dr. Holt Lundstad. She's a professor of psychology and neuroscience from Brigham Young University. Um, Matthew, I'm going to probably play the video in like three minutes, okay? Um, here's, here, here's just straightforward facts from her. Isolation and loneliness increase your risk of death by 26%. Keep that in mind, okay? Isolation, living alone, and poor social connections are as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Okay? 
Um, isolation is worse for you than obesity. Isolation and social isolation are associated with an increased risk of developing coronary disease and stroke. Isolation increases the risk of high blood pressure significantly. Isolation with severe depression is associated with early mortality and loneliness is a risk factor for depression in later life. Isolation and loneliness, isolation, uh, social isolation put individuals at greater risk of cognitive decline and dementia. Your isolation is one of the leading indicators of dementia at a later age, okay? I'm not talking about anything that you guys are doing. I'm not talking about you guys are doing lines of coke. I'm not talking about you guys are smoking crack. I'm not, like, I'm not, I'm, all, all I'm talking about is you guys are home alone or you guys don't have a in-depth social life. Vast majority of, um, I, I think it was 57% of Americans over the age of 55 said their most common company that they keep is their television. Think about that. How many of you guys are over the age of 55? This is just for my own curiosity, okay. So let, let me just ask, have I done a good enough job talking about why isolation is such a problem in America right now? Or are, do you guys feel content with the statistics? Not my opinion, with the statistics that I've shared. Okay, so I wanna get into the solution. To do so, I, I, I wanna give you guys a background of my last three years of my life. In 2019, my ministry, Engage Your Destiny, which is a military ministry, uh, we, we, we work with active duty military personnel and we work with veterans. Our entire focus has been active duty veterans until the pandemic, and then we went after the impossible mission, which was our tribute to Vietnam veterans. And everybody told us, this is gonna be too big, too late, too expensive, too impossible, you're foolish, da 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 okay? We still did it, and this is a video that shows kind of a summary of what we put together, and it's Mel Gibson narrated for us, and I know I can't do a voice better than he can because I don't have a radio voice, so let's just check this out. Like generations before them, when duty called, they answered. with unflinching bravery, with a hero's honor. But when they returned home, they were not met with a welcome. In fact, they were shamed, blamed, and rejected. The ripple effects of this are still felt by the veterans and their families today. And yet, despite the rejection, they still became guardians of honor for all those who served after them. Like true heroes, they never again allowed other warriors to be dishonored. As a nation, we're coming together to celebrate and honor these heroes the way they should have been honored five decades ago at the largest celebration of Vietnam veterans ever assembled to recognize them, to honor them and their families with the truth of their heroism, humanitarianism, courage, and sacrifice to fully and finally welcome them home. Together, we're giving our Vietnam veterans a tribute so meaningful, it will change history. Yeah, this, this thing, uh, yeah, this tribute took us three years to plan and execute. And um, it's hard for me not to get into the significance of why we did that event. That's not, that, that's not why I'm here, but it, it's hard. Um, so let me just give you guys kind of an overview of what this event entailed, okay? We had A-10 Warthogs military flyovers. We had the Missing Man Formation. Uh, the U.S. Air Force. We had an actual bald eagle fly over the audience. We had Bryce Cherry Holmes, who uh, lost his legs in, uh, when he was deployed out in the Middle East, um, and he got prosthetics because his dream was that he could stand for the national anthem and salute the flag, and he was able to do that from the stage on our, uh, during our event. 
Um, we had the national anthem sung by Savannah Madison. We had the bandit flight team flying all over. We had the Navy SEAL Patriot parachute team. We had music by Six String Soldiers, Natasha Owens, Craig Morgan, Justin Moore, and Toby Keith. Um, our speaker lineup was Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, Governor Ron DeSantis, Mark I. Oz Geist, if you guys haven't heard of him, he's a former Marine and member of the Annex uh, security team that fought the battle in Benghazi. Um, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, um, if you haven't heard of him, he was the U.S. Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. He was also one of the most badass human beings ever because he was one of the first members of Delta Force, which is Army's like Navy SEALs. Sorry, I should probably not say a double S. Uh, we had uh, <laughs> we had Medal of Honor recipient Major General uh, Patrick Brady, uh, probably one of the most legendary human beings I've ever had. Uh, ha had the honor of spending time with, a lot of time with, and then we had Chris Noel and Ann Margaret. As, I'm sure younger generation doesn't know Ann Noel or uh, Chris Noel and Ann Margaret, but older guys, do you guys know who? <laughs> do you? okay, the younger guys. Have you guys seen Grumpy Old Men? Yeah, she's the hot redhead, okay? But she, she, she did more for the Vietnam vets and went to Vietnam more often than Bob Hope did. Bob Hope had to recruit her because her and Chris Noel actually had more influence than he did, okay? So like, we honored them for what they did because most celebrities back in the day wouldn't do it. We had well over 40,000 people attend this event and it was brutally hot. I, I didn't even get to see the event for the most part. I was just doing medevacs all day from people having heat strokes. Uh, but on our way to this tribute, the Heroes Honor Festival, I almost took my own life, okay? Um, I'm not saying that as a woe is me. I just, I just, I just want to come back to the place that like, I am not sharing anything from a place of authority. I am not sharing from a place of superiority. I'm I just want to go back to the point that I'm a miserable human being. And, and it, it, it took something that I didn't know I needed until I surrounded myself with these warriors because they constantly were telling me how to be a better version of myself. So uh, in this process of almost taking my own life, I almost widowed my wife of 11 years. Uh, I almost uh, left my three daughters fatherless. Um, they are seven, five, and two. We have a fourth on the way. Um, and it, yes, it's going to be a girl because I don't think my Y chromosome works. Um, <laughs> and I would have left innumerable people. Like when, when you're in a position of influence with, um, and I don't know why this breaks my heart, is I deal with suicide, like I said, on an hourly basis. I'm, I'm taking veterans, I'm taking active duty military personnel out of suicide on a daily basis. What happens when the guy they come to to prevent themselves from committing suicide commits suicide? What happens when the guy these soldiers come to for support so that they don't take their own life? They come to me for that. What happens when the guy they come to to prevent themselves from committing suicide commits suicide himself? There's a huge implication to that. Just, just statistically speaking, if I were to commit suicide, my children are 47% more likely to commit suicide. Think about that. Just by me taking my own life. My children are by far more likely to take their lives than any of their friends. And the only reason I'm alive today, because a big part of me becoming so messed up in the head, so emotionally distraught, was I, I was just constantly isolated. I was constantly isolated. We all were. We all. Is there anyone in the pandemic that wasn't isolated? Well, you guys live in Wisconsin. I live in a communist state, so... I'm from Minnesota. Um, so here, here's why I share all that. And the only reason that I was able to even be saved, if you could put it that way, is that I learned something from these Vietnam vets um, around the significance of brotherhood. There's nothing more important that they taught me than faith and brotherhood. I've, I've been a man of faith, right? But they taught me, and, and, and I come from church circles. We talk about accountability and blah, 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 blah. But essentially all it becomes is just a handful of guys getting together talking about how often they masturbate or how often they watch porn. You're just like, seriously, this is, the, the, this, this is our 
group that's going to take us to new ventures, new success by talking about how often we watch porn, you know? And these guys, they taught me something so different because I come from that church culture that talks about like brotherhood all the time. But these Vietnam vets, man, they taught me something entirely different. These heroes that became my mentors and father figures, um, they taught me two things, and I said it already, but I'll, I'll put it in, in the best quote that I could put it in. The greatest source of victory in a life of a man is their faith and their brotherhood. Without those two things, no man will have a chance at even seeing a glimpse of what they're truly capable of or the greatness that they're destined for. No amount of money, power, status, so-called friends, or otherwise will ever reveal your true meaning in life. You're probably asking, what does brotherhood and isolation have anything to do? Isolation is a problem. Brotherhood is a solution. But brotherhood is so hard to get. It is absolutely challenging. It is overwhelming. But, man, I, I, I have never heard people that, that I respect so much emphasize the significance and the importance of something. And in America, I would say a lot of friendships are based on who we hang out with, who we, you know, drink beers with or whatever, go on double dates with or go hunting with or go fishing with, but it, it, it's not what these guys describe. It's not hanging out, you know? It's, it's I'm dying. And these guys know it before I do. And they come to my rescue kind of thing. You know, it's, it's very, very deep rooted. So questions I asked, maybe you're asking them, is how do I find brotherhood? What does brotherhood look like? What, what does, when you're together, what, what, what should I expect? These kind of things. And I honestly don't know everything about brotherhood, but I can tell you this, okay? These are, this is literally a list I wrote just based on trying to create this for myself. It does not come easy at all. It is not comfortable at all. It requires audacious risk. You have to risk vulnerability. You have to risk being hurt, betrayed, wounded, and disappointed. I can almost guarantee you those things will happen on your journey to find true brotherhood. It will not happen right away for the vast majority of us. Some of us are lucky enough to have those kind of people with us already, but we just need to take it to a deeper level. But for the vast majority of us, it will not come easy, fast, quick, in any way. It, will, uh, it requires time, committed and dedicated time. It has to be a priority or it won't happen. It will not happen by accident or happenstance. I will repeat that probably five more times. Again, feel free to slap me. It requires selflessness and being true to yourself. Both are equally important. There's no BS allowed at all in any way, shape, or form in these groups. If there is any form of half-truth, the entire thing is completely pointless. You just wasted everyone's time, especially your own. It has to be based on trust. It has to be safe to be exactly who you are for better or for worse. It requires and demands loyalty. It requires the sharing and confessing of your deepest, darkest secrets. It requires prayer. It requires goals. It requires hardcore and intense accountability. And it's not meant to be pleasant or comfortable. It's meant to help you dominate and conquer your goals, hopes, and aspiration. Do you know how I ended up in PTSD treatment for a month and a half? My buddy came to my house, knocked on my door, pushed me in. I can't take him. He's 6'6", all-American wrestler. So even if I would have tried, it would have been pointless because I would have ended up in a pretzel shape chewing on my elbow somehow. And he literally, he pushes me inside my own house, pushes me against the wall, asks where potential weapons are. I have to give him those weapons. And then he drags me down and sits me on the couch, tells my wife to come over. His wife ends up taking care of our kids. And he forces me to have a conversation with my wife to tell her exactly where I am in my life. For a month and a half, one of the guys, he became a father to my children while I was getting therapy. He took care of my wife. My other friend, he came over and literally would clean the cars, do all sorts of stuff. None of these people are getting paid. 
The only reason I had that is these Vietnam vets taught me something so freaking important that it literally saved my life. I established those things along the way, and when I lost it, when I needed it, I already had it. If you try to create it when you finally need it, I'm sorry, it's already too late. You're screwed. I don't want to be a bearer of bad news. I would have been absolutely, utterly screwed if I didn't establish those things that I learned from these Vietnam vets who are like my fathers and mentors, and some of them have already passed. <clears throat> it requires inconvenience. It requires consistency, and I mean religious consistency. And most of all, requires people who are equally passionate and in similar seasons of life as you. If you're married, get around married people. If you're a leader, get around other leaders. If you're a parent, get around other parents. Okay? And this isn't a type of group that you're meant to lead. And you're not meant to be led. These are your brothers. If you're constantly pulling these people that you're doing this with, it's not the right group. If these are, these are people that work for you and report to you, that's not the right group. You have to be in the same phase of life. There has to be a level of depth and understanding and empathy that cannot exist with people that you have to drag along with you. They have to have the same type of ambition. They have to want the same things that you want. They have to thirst and hunger the same way that you do. Fatherhood is such a priority to me Every guy around me will be the first to slap me if I am not a good father. It's unacceptable. There won't even be a conversation. It'll just get physical. And I love it. Like, there, it's not abusive to me. It's love. It's absolute, utmost love. This is not a ministry and this is not a project. So I gotta, I'm just going to repeat it. This is not meant for you to lead and this is not meant for you to be led. These are your brothers. You guys are side by side doing this thing called life. Everyone has talked about this. Everyone. I'm just going to pick, out of literally 128 quotes, I picked 12. By the foremost thought leaders, the greatest influencers, most legendary leaders, the most impactful human beings to ever live. I'm not even going to name them. I'm just going to say these quotes, okay? One, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Two, surround yourself with people who talk about visions and ideas, not other people. Three, love yourself enough to surround yourself with people that respect you. The company you keep is a reflection about how you feel about yourself. Four, show me your best friends and I'll show you your future. Five, we must live together as brothers or perish together as fools. Six, Never hold resentments for the person who tells you what you need to hear. Count them among your truest, most caring, and valuable friends. The vast majority of these, I could pimp out all sorts of Bible verses at you, but I'm not trying to do that. Seven, the idea of brotherhood redawns upon the world with a broader significance than the narrow association of members in a sect or creed. Your church is included in that sometimes. Brotherhood is the very price and condition of man's survival. Nine, either men will learn to live like brothers or they will die like beasts. Ten, trying to build the brotherhood of man without the fatherhood of God is like making a wheel without a hub. Eleven, there is a destiny which makes us brothers. None goes his way alone. All that we send into the lives of others comes back into our own. Last, number twelve, brotherhood is an ideal better understood by example than precept. Again, that's 12 of 128, greatest leaders that have ever lived. You won't remember my name. By the time I come, my name's Armin. You'll remember me as Armin, Starlin, Barman, Habib, you, wh whatever. I am truly an irrelevant human being. I haven't done anything spectacular for you guys. Ah, I don't remember what that guy said. Literally, this is nothing new under the sun. The greatest leaders, the greatest influencers, the most impactful human beings have been writing about this. I want to end with the Bible story, but before I do, I just want to point something out. I already made this point. I come from a church that pushes this kind of thing all the time, okay? 
But again, I'm not trying to be crass when I say this. I'm, telling, I'm just being bluntly honest. When we do this in my church, I get together with guys, and I tried so many times, it almost always becomes about porn addiction and masturbation. I'm sorry, I just don't want to hear that all the time. That, and, and let me tell you why that doesn't work, okay? Even if that's something real, I understand that's something that needs to stop. I'm not, I'm not I'm minimizing it, okay? But if I have you guys all close your eyes right now and I tell you, whatever you do, don't think about pink elephants, what are you going to do? It's a strategy that doesn't work. So when all you do, you get together and all you want to talk about is the things you want to stop doing, the things you want to prevent yourself from doing, the things you want to avoid, the things that you don't want to think about, the things you don't want to say, you're literally creating an obsession about those things until you redo them and repeat them. It's asinine. It doesn't work. If you're going to do something like this, and, and, and I'm coming from 10 years of failing, 11 years of failing at accountability with these guys, right? There has to be an approach to this that is not some pathetic, backwards, defensive strategy. What's the best defense? Green Bay Packers, right? Yeah, we finally know about that as a Vikings fan since 98. Uh, anyway, this, this has to be this group that you guys do. It has to think forward. It has to venture forward. It has to plan forward. It has to obsess about your goals and the things you want to achieve. It has to be bold. It has to, and you have to move boldly forward. Not, again, you can't be pathetically backwards. This is an offensive strategy. This is not a defensive strategy. This is... This, all this crap that you hear about toxic masculinity, use that. You, you need that. I don't care how much the society says that's bad. That is the greatest tool you got. Get angry. Get aggressive. Get bold. Screw what you don't want to do. Get so hell-bent on what you want to accomplish in life. You obsess over it so much and the people around you, you can't stop until you get there. That works. That makes you elite. And I'm, and, and I'm just saying the exact same things these Vietnam vets told me. Your time is now. It's not yesterday. It's not going to be tomorrow. It's right now. Right now is your time. Your greatest possible future could be based on the exact people sitting around you right now. My closest friends, were th those are the people I actually had to not do this type of brotherhood with. They're good to drink with. They're good to smoke weed with. They're good to do a lot of things other than do this depth of accountability. I had to rise up to a different level and it required me to find other people. Again, super uncomfortable. And there's so many things that are being fed to men right now that is such a crock of crap that it, it, it baffles me. So I'm going to, again, repeat what I've heard and you have to hear it over and over again until you accept it because the amount of times that you're going to hear the opposite is going to be overwhelming. Joy is yours to have. Peace is yours to have. Success is yours to have. Fulfillment and satisfaction is yours to have. But you have to take it. I don't care who caused that masculine or toxic masculinity. Take it. It will never be handed to you. It's not going to happen by accident or happenstance. This is your way of building a special forces elite team around you to make you the absolute best version of your sin yourself and I promise you age is irrelevant the average age of a Vietnam vet right now is about 76 most of them I met they had, they had to redo their whole brotherhood because the vast majority of their brothers died they still do what they what they taught me they just create a new brotherhood so sum summarize isolation is one of the biggest problems in your life and it's killing you and your dreams and your family Brotherhood is the answer, but it requires a ton of intentionality and risk. Okay, I'll, I'll just repeat that so it doesn't, all this blabbing doesn't become pointless. Isolation is the biggest problem that we're dealing with. It's killing you, yourself, and your dreams, and your family. Brotherhood is an answer that requires a ton of intentionality and risk. There is no rocket science to this, there are, but there are rules to play by. If you don't like mine, the ones I've learned, the ones I've adopted that have helped me, that have saved me, Write your own. Figure out what works for you. The impo most important part of this is act. Act on this. Here's my closing story, okay? 
and I'm done. I, I hope I'm not going over too much. It's from Mark 2, okay? Um, it says, and again, he entered Capernaum um, after some days, and it was heard that he, talking about Jesus, was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. This house was so packed with people that the only way people could even listen to what Jesus had to say was they had to stand outside the door, and the door was packed. They couldn't even get through, okay? Um, so, uh, where was I? Not even near the door. And he preached the word, he being Jesus, preached the word to them. Then they came to him, uh, him being Jesus, and this is, this is their t- them being a group of guys, like a handful of guys, uh, bringing a paralytic man who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him, Jesus, because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they lit down the man on a bed, which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, their faith. So whose faith? Their, their faith, the four men, the four men. Not the paralytic guy, okay? It doesn't say the faith of the paralyzed guy. It doesn't say because Jesus pitied the guy that was paralyzed. It didn't say because Jesus saw the need of this guy who was paralyzed. But because Jesus saw the faith of the four men that literally took this dude, dragged him for miles on a mat, climbed a freaking roof, ripped the freaking roof off, and lowered this guy in front of Jesus to say, heal my guy, okay? So because of their faith, Jesus eventually says to the paralytic man, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately, this paralytic man, he arose, took up the bed and went out in the presence of them all so that all were amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. If you don't have friends in your life that will drag you for miles to take you to the exact thing that you need, not want, but the thing that you need. And if they're not willing to rip a roof off of someone's house to bring you in front of the exact resource that you need to save you from whatever financial problem, business problem, leadership problem, parenting problem, whatever problem you got, if you don't have those people that are willing to be that aggressive to bring you into a new life, go get it. Just act on it. I already listed off how hard it is. It's not going to be easier. It's not going to be comfortable, but it needs to happen. My brothers, please hear me. I'm done. I'm done. I promise, Lee. Even if you don't believe me, just hear me say this to you. You are worth it. You are worthy of it. Let nothing and no one especially yourself, stand in the way of this. It will bring you to your greatest breakthroughs. It may save your life like it saved my life. For the love of God, for the love of family, for the love of country, my brothers, please, please choose to be blessed. Surround yourselves with blessings. Thank you for having me. Sorry if I went over. Feel free to do the swift kick.